Now that we know a little bit about the structure of electrons and atoms, we're going to distinguish between the electrons that we find in an atom. In particular, we're going to distinguish between what are called core electrons and valence electrons. Our learning goals are to understand the structure and meaning of the periodic table of the elements because it is intimately tied to this issue of core versus valence electrons. And we want to know the role of core and valence electrons in defining properties for the elements. All right, so we're going to start with a little bit of a thought experiment. And what we're going to do is figure out what happens when we organize elements in columns according to similarities in chemical properties. All right, so the very first element, that is atomic number one, is hydrogen. Atomic number two is helium. All right, we know that those two are very dissimilar, so they're not going to be in columns. But when we get to the third element, which is lithium, it actually has some chemical similarities to hydrogen. They both form a plus one ion, you know, other things that they form uh, compounds that are very similar. A problem happens when we get to number four, though. When we get to beryllium, number four, it's not like helium at all. And in fact, we now have to adjust our arrangement here and move helium over one because clearly beryllium is not like that. Now I'm going to take a little gap here and I'm going to go forward until we reach the next element that is similar to lithium and to hydrogen. And it turns out that doesn't happen until we get to element number 11, which is sodium. So those three in a column make sense, at least from a chemical standpoint. Okay, the element that comes next after sodium is in fact very similar to beryllium in terms of its chemical properties. But it leaves us with sort of the uh, question, what happened to elements 5 through 10 and where do they sit and how do they compare to helium? Well, when we add those in, those are boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and finally neon. All of them have nice mnemonic uh, elemental symbols. It turns out that helium isn't like any of those except for neon at the very end. So that's where we put helium. So it turns out between hydrogen and helium there's got to be this big gap. But the others all fall neatly in columns. And when we start filling out after magnesium, element number 12, we find aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. And they all have properties chemically that are similar to the elements that are right above them. So we have succeeded now in arranging the elements in terms of columns uh, with similar properties. Now, of course, we can do this for all of the elements, and that's precisely what Dmitry Mendeleev did back in the late 19th century. And uh, his uh, arrangement is something we know of as the periodic table, and this is the very beginning of it. You can see that the numbers there indicate the number of elements that are there, and they correspond to the number of elements that fit into each electron shell. Now Mendeleev's periodic table looks more like this, and you can see that in fact another gap comes in between beryllium and boron, uh, and also between magnesium and aluminum, uh, to separate those. So this is the way we currently organize the periodic table now, and I want to take a few minutes to uh, establish what those uh, structures indicate. So here is the periodic table written again, and once again I'll point out that each column represents a group of elements that have similar chemical properties. And in fact, we do call these columns groups. That's the formal name for them. So on the far left-hand side, we have hydrogen, then lithium, then sodium, potassium, and then the bigger ones are rubidium, cesium, and francium. We probably won't talk about them too much in this course. On the right-hand side, we have helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. They all have great chemical similarities. They don't form compounds. So their similarity is that all of them are totally inert. All of the ones in between have uh, similar properties to those below. What about the rows? Well, the rows correspond to the electron shells, as we were pointing out on the previous slide. And the first row, which has two elements, corresponds to the innermost shell. The next row has eight and is the second shell. The third row has eight, that's the third shell. The fourth show, row, which is the fourth shell, has 18 in it. And those indicate the number of electrons that fill into those uh, shells as we build up the periodic table. Now, I want to take this uh, 
opportunity to show how the structure of the periodic table helps us to understand something fundamental about the different types of electrons. So I want to define core and valence electrons for you. Core electrons are the innermost electrons. They are in the filled shells that are closest to the nucleus. So every uh, shell that is completely full of electrons, can't hold any more electrons, and is close to the nucleus, that represents a core electron. So the other kind are valence electrons. They are the ones that are found in the outermost shell, farthest from the nucleus. And uh, most of the time, the valence electron shells are not full. In other words, they still have some vacancies where we can fit a few more electrons. Let's look at an example, calcium, which is element number 20. So I'm going to draw a, a nucleus, rep, represent a nucleus by a, a blue circle with a plus 20 in it. And we're going to start filling in the electrons around calcium. So the first ones, the core electrons that are closest to the nucleus, include two that are in the innermost shell, plus eight that are in the next shell, plus another eight. Now we have a total of 18. We still need two more electrons to finish out calcium. So those two are going to end up being valence electrons in the fourth shell around the nucleus. And I've colored them red so you can see them more easily. But there they are, farthest from the nucleus, the valence electrons, and there are two of them. Always you should have, for a neutral atom, the number of valence electrons plus the number of core electrons is equal to the atomic number, so, in, so that you have a total net charge of zero. Now those valence electrons are the farthest from the nucleus, which means it requires the least amount of energy to remove them from the atom. This is important because it means that they are going to be the most active. That is to say, as atoms begin to interact with one another, it's the valence electrons that are at the heart of all of that. So it's going to be important for you to be able to recognize how many valence electrons each element has. So let's do a little practice. How many valence electrons does sulfur have? Okay, we start counting from the nearest filled shell. Once we've got a filled shell, those are all core electrons. So if we have a, a partially filled shell, then we're talking about valence electrons. So here is sulfur on the periodic table, element number 16. And the nearest filled shell is going to be represented by the element on the far right column. Okay, so that in this case is neon. Okay, the first, first shell has two electrons, the second shell has eight neon represents the filled second shell, and now sulfur is in the third shell. So if we count from neon to sulfur, that will tell us how many valence electrons there are in sulfur. So as we count, we go one, two, three, four, five, and six. So sulfur rather has a total of six valence electrons um, and, um, and a total of 10 core electrons to make up its electron count. Now, as an exercise, I'd like for you to do the same thing, now doing this for the number of valence electrons for chromium. So you may want to pause this right now, and then we'll get to the answer in just a moment. All right, did you find chromium? Were you able to count from the nearest filled shell? Let's shift our picture here a little bit. Um, chromium is here, element number 24, and since the nearest filled shell is on the far right-hand side of the periodic table, we just need to start counting from the left side. So we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So just like sulfur, chromium has six valence electrons. Now, don't be misled into thinking that all elements have six valence electrons. That just uh, happened to be the coincidence of these two cases. It's also not true that if they have six valence electrons that they're always going to have the same chemical properties. Chromium and sulfur are very different in their chemical behavior, in part because the six uh, electrons around sulfur include s and p orbital electrons, whereas uh, for chromium they include some other orbitals that we haven't talked about. So the quality of the orbitals also matters when think, talking about chemical properties. All right, we're going to learn more about core, core and valence electrons as we move on in the course.